Well, hello students. This is Professor Shalomo Levy and I'm recording this video for you today from my office here at Northampton Community College in Bethlehem, Pennsylvania. Uh, I'm recording this video in an effort to speak to you, to establish a more personal rapport beyond a lot of the emails and messages you receive from me, and particularly for a lot of my students who are studying with me online. So whether you're online or on campus, uh, we are approaching the first exam of our course in American History 1, and I'd like to uh, give you some advice about how to prepare for that exam, what to expect uh, on the exam, and I'll also uh, show you some screenshots of what things look like. Uh, first of all, I want to thank everyone for their effort, for being engaged, for doing uh, the reading, and for your performance on the first few assignments uh, that I've read and graded uh, in Blackboard. Uh, those discussions are very relevant um, to the exam that's coming up. But uh, first of all, what I want you to know is the exam covers all that we have studied and learned over the first three weeks of the course, which of course includes the assigned chapters from our online textbook, chapters one through four, but it also includes my PowerPoint presentations, uh, the notes that I present in class, uh, that those describe things that I want to emphasize. It includes some new information that's not in the textbook. Uh, I do that uh, particularly for students uh, who attend class so that they learn something new. If the professor just repeats what was said in the book, if you've read the book, then there's not much purpose served in coming to class. So I always try to present some new information to make it interesting uh, so that you learn uh, more about the subject than what's contained in the book. So therefore, your total amount of knowledge comes from what you've learned from the book plus what you've learned from the professor in class. In this case, this comes from the text and from my presentation. So make sure you look at the presentations as well. Thirdly, I always include historical documents. And those documents are from the period that we're studying. Uh, they often are historical letters, uh, like the letter from the Catholic priest, Father Bartholomew de la Casas, um, or uh, other documents from each period. So they're contained, digitized in our Blackboard shell as well. Uh, that's part of your learning material. And so in preparing for this exam, you should have read the chapters, study my presentations, and examine the documents. If you've done those things, um, then you're probably in good shape uh, for this exam. I recommend that students learn the material as it's assigned each week. Typically, I'll assign only one chapter a week, um, as opposed to waiting until there's an exam, as we have this week, and attempting to read four chapters at one time, uh, and all of my presentations, and all of the documents. Um, if you wait and then cram at the end, you'll probably retain less of what you do read, and uh, you'll understand less of the material. So, so try to do it as we assign it, and then, for those students, what studying involves is merely reviewing what you've already learned, not trying to learn all the material before the exam. That's an important difference. So if you've done all the reading, you've done all the assignments, then I think it should take you no more than a half hour, 45 minutes at the most, just to review your notes and to go over the material. In that sense, studying for you is merely refreshing your memory, not trying to learn everything the night before. So that's much better, much better results if you do it that way. Also, the material is much more manageable uh, because it is a lot contained in there, uh, but that is manageable if you stay on top of it each week. Uh, in addition, in the online textbook, uh, some of the features that I want you to pay close attention to are the um, learning objectives at the beginning of each chapter. Those learning objectives tell you what the purpose of the chapter is and what the author and the professor hopes you're going to get out of reading the chapter. Um, and then at the end of each chapter there are um, in-text activities and uh, practice exams 
in the textbook. I highly recommend that you take those practice exams to test your own knowledge. The good thing about those practice exams is they do not affect your grade in the course. I don't see them, um, but they're for your edification. It tells you uh, how well you understood the chapter. It tells you where you're strong and where you're weak. And so if you take those exams and you're getting 80s, 90s, then you're probably um, um, learning what you're expected to and you're in good shape. Um, and if you're getting grades lower than you expect, then this gives you an opportunity to, to brush up just in those areas, just in those questions that you got wrong, so that if you should see a similar question like that on the actual exam, you won't make the same mistake. It familiarizes you with the style and structure of the questions. Uh, I should tell you that the publishers send me uh, a battery of questions that I can use. So on the exam, some of those will be questions that I've written myself. Some of those questions are provided to me by the publishers. So there's a very similar, a very similar um, style uh, of the way the questions are worded, how the choices are arranged, and so uh, that will give you um, some practice. It also can help build your confidence. So once you're getting, I would say, 80s and 90s on the practice exams, you should do as well on the actual exam. Some people even believe some of the practice questions are harder. Uh, finally, with that, I, I, as an incentive for students, I often borrow some of the practice questions and put them on the actual exam. Um, so that way, you know, if you've taken the practice exam, some of the same questions will be uh, on the actual exam. Also, the weekly discussion essays. Most exams will include an essay. And so the best way to prepare for the essay portion of the exams are through the, the discussion questions that I give each week. Those questions are very similar to the kind of question I would ask on an exam, except in fuller form. So this gives you practice um, composing written responses to historical questions. If you do that every week, and you do a good job of that. Uh, of using um, facts to support your answers. Um, and uh, if, if I choose a question that you've already addressed in some way during a previous week, then, then the exam is kind of like deja vu. It's on a subject that you've already thought about, perhaps already written about, and so you know what it is you want to say and pretty much how you want to say it. So those discussion questions uh, could help you. Um, those of you who've been checking your grades might notice that um, students often earn extra credit on those discussion questions. So if they're worth 10 to 12 points each week, it's not unusual for students who do very good essays, who respond to other students in their work, either compliments or responses, or continuing the conversation. Uh, they often earn 14, 15 points in a discussion. Those extra points could help their average at the end of the course. So if you think about you know, what to do for the course, um, sometimes students do extra credit papers. If you're interested in that, you would have to uh, notify me uh, before the sixth week of the course, indicating that, that you're going to do a paper and we have to agree on what the topic is going to be, how you're going to go about it. I do have some instructions in Blackboard under extra credit. Um, if you're in a writing intensive course, a G section of the course, or in the honors section of the course, then the paper is automatically included. Uh, as part of your requirements. So those are just some of the things that I want you to consider uh, for the exam. Now the big picture um, beyond just like all the facts, I do have a review sheet in uh, Blackboard and these review sheets are created as a checklist of important names, people, and events. If you consult the review sheet uh, which I originally created using a different textbook, but uh, they're, they're pretty similar in context. All the textbooks uh, for this course um, cover the same topics. It's just a matter of preference of which one a professor chooses to use. Um, so they cover all the similar topics, but in any event, what I would recommend that you do is that you cross off all the things that you know on the list to reduce a list of maybe 20, 30 things down to maybe five things that you don't know. Um, then you could look up 
those individual things um, before the exam. That way when you go into the exam, there won't be any subject or topic or person or event that you're unfamiliar with. Also, I recommend that you try association rather than rote memorization. Association is to connect like-minded things or similar things together. So rather than thinking of these as, as a lot of random historical facts, to see the relationships between those. So as I look at the review sheet for chapter one, um, I would look at things like, or names like um, Hernan Cortez, Francisco Pizarro, um, and put them together with the conquistadors. Or people like Christopher Columbus, Fernand Mangella, these are all Spanish explorers. And so I could put them in one category. Although there may be three or four or five different people, that's only one category. And I would connect that um, together. Uh, similarly, something like the Olmecs, the Aztecs, the Mayans, these are all Native American cultures, pre-Columbian cultures. And so I, I think of them as a group. Um, when you approach it that way, although there's a lot of things that we study in this course and there are a lot of facts to know, there are, they are only about a very few number of subjects, maybe four or five subjects in that chapter or topics in that chapter. Although there may be 30 things, there are only about four categories. And so it's easier to organize four categories than to organize 30 unrelated facts. So. So try to see the relationships and organize them and categorize them uh, in your mind as you, as you look at those relationships. Uh, the last thing I'll say um, about the goal of the material in this unit is what we're trying to teach students is how this country evolved, how it developed. And so in that first chapter, we look at the indigenous people, the people who were here first. What were they like? What were their cultures um, like? Um, their contributions to, to human civilization. Um, that is the purpose of looking um, at indigenous people. Then as we turned our attention both to Europe and Africa, um, we, we are attempting to understand why Europeans were exploring in the 15th century. What were they out there doing? What were they looking for? And how did that goal lead, in some very unexpected ways, to their settlement in North and South America? So in that, this is why we talked about what they really were trying to get to, is to India and China in search of certain products that were in high demand in Europe. And if they could find a sea route to Asia, they can get those products much more cheaply. This started a kind of exploration race in Europe. And the Portuguese began uh, exploring a sea route going south in the Atlantic, which therefore brought them in contact with the continent of Africa. The Spanish, with Columbus, uh, began going west uh, in the hopes of going around the earth and coming up in the east. And that obviously brought them in contact with two continents that they didn't know were, were in the way, North America and South America, where we are. This is called serendipity, unexpected consequences. Uh, but those two things of discovering what was called the New World and coming in contact with Africa had profound impact on how America developed. The New World was not Asia, did not have uh, the silks and spices that they were looking for, but it had other products that the Spanish and then the English uh, began to develop. That caused the demand for labor to manufacture those to grow those products, sugarcane in the Caribbean and South America, tobacco in North America, and the labor to do that. What you saw in chapters three and four is that um, understanding this on a more sophisticated and detailed level is that Europeans were not all the same. The Spanish were first and the Portuguese, they were very different from the Dutch, the French, and the English that followed each had their own approach and their own attitudes with regard to dealing with native people and dealing with African people. We saw that the English 
attempted first to uh, bring over white indentured servants in the 1600s to grow the tobacco here in America. And for the first few decades of, of the six, 1600s, it was white workers called indentured servants who grew the tobacco. Um, and they were promised land at the end of their service, term of service, which could be from three to five to seven years, and they were called indentured servants. Uh, they started to bring over small numbers of Africans who were also treated much like indentured servants in those early decades. But following Bacon's Rebellion in 1676, um, where a group of mostly freed white indentured servants and some Africans staged a rebellion against the colonial government of Virginia, from that point on, uh, plantations switched from white indentured labor to African slave labor. And at that point, Africans are treated more like property and less like people. And this is how the system of slavery developed in America. So that's important to know that it, it, it wasn't just an innate feeling and attitude. It didn't begin immediately. It evolved or, or devolved in that sense over time and to the harsh system uh, that we knew it, knew it to be. Um, and I believe that's where we ended with chapter four, with week three uh, in the lecture. So that's the big picture that we hope you're understanding. It's a very interesting, fascinating story. Um, and all the details of this are contained in the chapters and in the lectures. Finally, I want to invite students um, to come see me personally if you feel the need. Uh, I have office hours posted on the top of my syllabus and you're welcome to come here and talk to me privately about the course. We can go over material. I'm here three hours a week just to talk to students. Very few students take advantage of those office hours either in my course or in their other courses. So if you're in the area, come on down and uh, we can talk personally uh, during my office hours. Hope you're enjoying the course. Take care and be well.